We are now going to start off with biblical therapy. And why do we believe in biblical therapy? Well, we have to have an introduction to biblical therapy in order to understand from why, where we are taking this thing. It means overcoming your life issues. That's what biblical therapy is all about. It's for you to overcome your issues. You've got issues, haven't you? Who's going to sort them out? Some little magical pill. Uh-uh, we know now that makes the things worse. Can we go run off to some other human being who's sitting with maybe more issues than you have? And did you know that most secular therapists have all got their own therapists? Who in turn have got their therapists? Who in turn have got their therapists? I've got one therapist. His name, the Word of God. The Word of God. And he's always telling me the same truth. What he tells me is not based on how he feels that day, whether he got his Kellogg's Rice Krispies for breakfast or not. What he counsels me with is always constantly the same. It's the truth of God. So, I ask myself the question, why do I keep on doing the things that I don't want to do? Isn't that a good definition of my issues? Are you with me, guys? Yeah. I mean, how many of you have gone through life how many times and said, hey man, I've got to stop this nonsense. I can't hear me aan gaan nie. Maar stop jy. Misschien vir a week of twee of drie, maar as jy weer sien, pel, as jy tot oor jou oore in die selle ding. En het is sommer sikke syklisse. En die syklisse word al oor erger. Have you noticed? Some guys stop drugs for a couple of weeks or a few months even. And then when they eat the stuff again, guess what? <laughs> Nog a paar trap is frotter. Then they're going to some kind of a rehab, and then what happens is they come out of rehab. They hold it for a while, they keep things together for a while, with a heck of a lot of effort. And as they weer sien, and then clap hulle die leine. And then clap die leine hulle terug. And as hulle nog dieper in die moeilijkheid. So, why do I do what I don't want to do? Those are my issues. Okay, so, introduction. It has been many years that we at Extreme Freedom have been researching, studying and applying certain programs in an attempt to help people through their life controlling destructive habits. The quest for truth started personally for me in 1987 when I opened the first inter inner city anti-drug disco for teenagers which we call Club Regeneration. The name was strange at the time and it came through much prayer. It meant to convey the message that God was relating to this generation, that's why we call it re, referring to generation, through a desire to make them new. Later on I discovered that this word was used in some places in the Bible and it also often appeared in theological books that taught the process one goes through from salvation to glorification from the day that you are born again until the day that you are promoted to heaven then you are glorified okay Gen regeneration is the supernatural rebirth of a person when they pronounce faith in the sacrifice of jesus christ for their sins when you are reborn you are regenerated <laughs> titus 3 4 but when the kindness and love of god our savior toward men appeared not by works of righteousness which we have done because we can't do right things we keep on doing the wrong things but according to his mercy he saved us through he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the holy spirit in other words he regenerated our spirit and then in the next years that followed, he kept on cleansing us through the working of his Holy Spirit and the word of God. Because the two are always in agreement. Whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. That being justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. In other words, there is a hope. And that, that hope is I'm going to live eternally and I'm going to live eternally where? With God in his place called heaven. Blessed be the God, 1 Peter 1, 3. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has regenerated us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. At that time, drug abuse and the addictions that came with it was still the exception to the norm. That was the violence of drugs. Our focus was more towards prevention, so we spent a lot of time talking to teenagers at the club, at their schools, and wherever they socialized. We had a lot of awareness projects running in shopping centers where we educated the public and parents on what to do to prevent drug abuse among their kids. <coughs> so Michael is this morning at this primary school giving his testimony and talking to the kids about not getting into drugs. Receive Jesus Christ in your life when you're young. Then you're not going to bypass all this other rubbish. As time went by, we had to deal more and more with counseling families where one or more of the teenagers started experimenting. This was normally discovered by their parents because of dysfunctional behavior at school or at home. This behavior manifested in the form of truancy, staying away from school, aggression towards family members, petty theft, lying and manipulation, and in extreme cases, clashes with the law and running away from home. In some cases, there was also involvement with self-styled Satanism and other forms of witchcraft. This is now in the early days. So, due to exposure through the media by means of talks on the radio as well as TV interviews, I became sought after in terms of counseling families with the above mentioned issues. I counseled as best as I could based on my own previous involvement with drugs and Satanism. But I soon realized that more specialized training was needed to deal with these very complex issues. Every possible avenue of theological and Christian based counseling training was researched here in South Africa, but I just could not find anything that was purely Bible based and addiction related. The secular models proved to be very ineffective with a success rate of 5% and less. Why go and study something that doesn't work? You're mad. I was mad because I took drugs, but when the Lord sorted me out, I decided, let's find out what God says. Attempts were made to associate with an organization in the USA called Teen Challenge with a proven success rate of 67% and more, but I just did not come together. With the advent of broadband internet, I could spend some time on cyberspace looking for an online university that could cater for my needs. I came across a few that offered degree courses in biblical counseling that would address some of the issues we had to deal with. I enrolled in a B-min degree and later on was allowed to enroll in Therapon University for a PhD in biblical counseling with belief therapy as a major subject. Belief therapy is a registered brainchild of Dr. Paul Carlin who developed and tested the program in prisons in certain states in the USA. The premise of belief therapy is that people do what they do because what they believe. In other words, their behavior is basically determined by their belief systems. In practice, this means that when people believe lies to be the truth, their lives will be dysfunctional. This all makes sense now for you, doesn't it? In belief therapy, the therapist confronts the lies his client believes with the truth in God's word. He or she is then challenged to change their mind and their belief system to bring it in line with God's will. Issues such as doubt, fear, perceived rejection, guilt, anxiety, stress and various forms of depression are dealt with and the healing process is started. Once new Bible, biblically based thinking patterns are established, the person is on the way to a radically new lifestyle. This also correlates with the teaching of many other Bible-based counseling luminaries, such as Dr. J. Adams, Dr. Wayne Mack, John C. Broger, and Adam Pulaski, to name a few. It is all out of this wide but in-depth pool of resources that we've put together this basic Bible therapy handbook. I no longer give you a handbook because these things were lying around. I now give you the notes and you make up your own handbook. How's that? And in the meantime, you write. And while you're writing, you never, you know what? You're rewiring your brain. You see? Okay. Proverbs 11:14. Where no wise gardens ease, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. So did I go and did I go and counsel with a whole lot of people before I put the program together? Yes. Adam Pulaski, Broger, Jay Adams. Dr. Carlin, and a whole bunch of oaks. 
I went and said, look, what did they say? And where they were in complete agreement with one another, I knew, hey man, this is the word of God speaking. Let's get this thing together. So yeah, you got it. Belief drives behavior. Just to prove that we as biblical therapists are not out on a limb, there are a few highly esteemed secular therapists and Christian psychologists who agree with the premise that it is our beliefs that drive our emotions and then our actions. One such person, and this guy is not a Christian, was Dr. Albert Ellis, he's now dead, who developed what is known as rational, that's thinking, emotive, uh, feelings, behavior, therapy. In other words, my thinking determines my emotions, which determines my behavior. Okay, you got that. Its premise is based on the feelings, on the following. R-E-B-T begins with A-B-C. A is for activating experiences. These are the things you go to, such as family troubles, unsatisfying work, early childhood traumas, and all the many things we point to as sources of our unhappiness. Those are activating experiences. B stands for beliefs, especially the irrational, self-defeating beliefs that are the actual sources of our unhappiness. Because we go through unhappiness, we build up a belief system. That belief system is based on negative experiences. So what does it actually point to at the end of the day? We start believing lies. And C is for consequences. The neurotic symptoms and negative emotions such as depression, panic, and rage that come from our beliefs. For example, a depressed person feels sad and lonely because he erroneously thinks he's inadequate and deserted. Actually, depressed people perform just as well as non-depressed people. So a therapist should show the depressed person his or her successes and then attack the belief that they are inadequate rather than attacking the mood itself. So let's forget about what you feel right now, you feel inadequate. But let's have a look at what you've achieved in the past. Were you such a loser? No, there were certain things in your life that you did right. So let's deal with this lie. You're not a total palooka. There are some good things that you've done in your life. And you were loved and cared for and, and, and uh, you were socializing normally with other people before until you became an addict and your behavior became so fraught. Nobody wanted you anymore. That's why you now feel inadequate. It's because of the drugs, China, and it's because of who you are. You got it? There's a finicky and I. Okay. Although it is not important to therapy to pinpoint the sources of these irrational beliefs, it is understood that they are the result of philosophical conditioning. Philosophical means thinking. Habits, not unlike the habit of answering the phone just because it rings. Further, Alice says that we are biologically programmed to be susceptible to this kind of conditioning. Well, it's true. A child doesn't have to learn to be naughty. It is in its genes to be naughty. So we are biologically programmed to be negative. Because of the sin factor. Nah. Irrational beliefs equals sin. In biblical terms, we know that the irrational belief Dr. Alice refers to is in fact the lies that Satan spreads around. We also know that the philosophical conditioning he refers to is our subconscious awareness of sin and how we relate to that. The biological programming points to our propensity to disobey God and to do our own thing. I mean, there's Adam and Eve in paradise they got no worries at all. God says, don't eat that tree's fruit. What do they do? That's human nature. What are you going to find? What you are going to find from time to time are references to research and findings by noted psychologists that correlate greatly with the same truths we find in the Bible. I quote these guys, not because I believe in them. I quote them purely to prove that what they have gone and found out through research is already recorded in the Bible. Their little egos and pride prevented them from going to hear from God first. So they had to go and find out and find out and find out. And eventually they came to the same conclusions as what is written in the Bible. What does it tell you? Go to the Bible first. Not so. Isn't that the more intelligent way to go? Hmm. 
That's why I didn't went and studied psychology. Uh, it is not what we are trying to validate what God says to be true by quoting them. It is just that we want the reader to understand that God has given us a handbook on humanity that covers every single aspect of our spiritual, psychological and practical living experience. It's all there in the word. From our study so far, we can come to no other conclusion, conclusion but that God is the ultimate and supreme psychologist we can get counseling from. There is, however, one great and unchangeable fact. God does not theorize. He doesn't have to make up a theory and then try and prove it. God says it's this way and it is that way because why? It comes out of him and he's truth. You don't have to prove. Theories have to be proven before they become fact. God says something because it is fact. That's it. Okay. God does not theorize. He states immutable and Indis undisputable truth because he is truth. Furthermore, if we follow and obey his counsel, the outcome is guaranteed. He also provides an unchanging standard by which we can measure our functionality and clarity of mind. This has been the anomaly, the problem, that could never be resolved among secular psychologists and theorists. Namely, where to find a perfect man against which we can be measured. We all have our own shortcomings, failings and weaknesses when we are fruitful, when we are truthful. Jesus Christ has, was the only one ever in whom no sin or wrongdoing or lies could be found. Consequently, he is the one against whom all of us are measured. In science, if you want to prove a theory, you do a couple of experiments. If you come to the same result every time, guess what? The theory is proven to be factual and it is scientific. Now, if you want to find out how is man going to be proven to be right or wrong, against which man are you going to measure him? You can't. You have to measure him against Christ. So he's our standard. So as far as Biblical therapy is concerned, it is scientific because it's got a measuring stick against which you can measure. In psychology, you don't have it because you have no perfect man against which to measure yourself. You understand? So they try and tune us. What we believe in the Bible is mumbo jumbo. Who's busy with mumbo jumbo? They are. Because what they're stating and what they're theorizing is not provable. There's no man against which you can prove it. We can prove what we say against the word of God and against Jesus Christ. So I have a measuring rod against which I can prove my functionality or dysfunctionality. All right. Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory. There's no man against which we can measure ourselves. Jesus is the word of God. Biblical therapy is a faith-based process during which we compare the lies that have formed our belief system with the truth according to God's word. According to the Bible, we discover that the embodiment of God's word is his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus and the word, one and the same. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And in verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. We also learn from Genesis, which reveals to us the creative process through which God brought the physical creation into being, that he spoke it all into existence. So through his word, the heavens and the earth was produced, which denotes the creative force of God's word. Furthermore, he keeps it all in perfect balance, sustains it and grows it through his word. John 1, 3, all things came into being through him. And without him, not even one thing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overtake it. So the truth will always prevail over the lie, provided you believe the truth. Jesus equals power to change. The life referred to in the scripture is twofold. It is a life as in life and death. But it is also a life that brings light as in spiritual awakening. Darkness is the absence of light as lies are the absence of truth. Every day we have the day and night to remind us of this reality. 
namely that God made a difference between light and darkness through his word. He also sustains the system through his word. His word is the exact expression of himself because God cannot speak a lie due to his holy and righteous nature. In order to make himself plainly visible to us, he took on human flesh and came to earth according to the prophecies he gave through his servants, the prophets, over many thousands of years. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1, God who had many times in many ways spoken the past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds who being the shining splendor of his glory and the express image of his essence and upholding all things by the word of his power through himself cleansing us of our sins he sat down on the right hand of majesty on high. So all of this stuff that we see in creation is to prove that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and what's more, that He has the power to change us from sinful creatures to saints. Got it? Don't forget it. So in fact, we see that Jesus Christ is the Word of God and He has the power to cleanse us from our sins. We will look into this more deeply, as for now, we must just want to lay a basic foundation for the dynamics of biblical therapy. Jesus, our standard, and the word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us, John 1, 14. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Very, very important. When we go back again to Genesis, we also find the origin of sin, and we see that it directly related to the believing of a lie by Adam and Eve. The lie they believed was that if they disobeyed God by eating the forbidden fruit, they would become just like Him. They were already like Him. According to Scripture, they were already created in His image. All Satan had in mind was for them to disobey God. By disobeying God, they put distrust in their minds concerning His word that's why we have to believe again he wanted their trust and allegiance to god to shift away from the source of truth and light to the lie and darkness which would lead to death biblical therapy therefore is in a nutshell is to expose the lies we believe by comparing that with the word of god and then to change our minds back into trusting and believing what god tells us to do our standard for truth then becomes the life and teachings of Jesus. Jesus is the way. John 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, so that where I am, you may also be and where i go and where i go you know and the way you know and thomas said to him lord we do not know where you go how can we know the way jesus said to him i am the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father but by me and when other religions belief systems hear these words they grind and gnash their teeth <coughs> they don't want to hear <coughs> that there was a man on earth who was perfect and they are not because when you don't believe in Jesus Christ you set yourself up to believe in your own little God and most of the time that little God is who? you yourself nah yeah explain your list check your silhouette In a later, more in-depth study from a book called Biblical Directionism by Dr. Dennis Frey, who is currently president of Master's Divinity School, the, school, the uh, place where I studied at first, the student will find there is a concept called comparative silhouetting. I compare my silhouette with someone else's silhouette. Comparative silhouetting is the process of using data, information, gathered during determinative profiling in such a way as to obtain an outline of the individual's past, and present state of being over that of the biblical norm from this comparative silhouette a revealing picture is developed which when assessed 
when assessed, will provide the counsellor a base from which to determine counselling need and potential. This is because when the determinative profile, which is essential data, is contrasted with a comparative silhouette, the result is the formation of a biblical process data into useful counselling information. Now, all that that really says is, there's your profile, there's Jesus' profile, and when we compare the two, they should meet at certain points. When they don't, there is a dissonance. There is a difference. We can focus on the differences and get them in line. Through the word of God, through truth. In effect, it means that in biblical therapy, we are constantly comparing our beliefs to that of Jesus Christ as recorded in the Bible. In Lamentations 3.40, we find, let us search and try our ways and turn again to Jehovah. 